Hello. I'm Stefan Graber. I've got uh, Christian Branner here. And today we're going to be going over the state of the user namespace. We both work at, uh, at Canonical, and we are the project leaders for Lexi and Lexi, um, container managers. And Christian also works on a variety of uh, Canon components. OK. Um, user namespaces and uh, container security. This is a quick recap uh, and uh, how, I, how and why we think this is relevant. Um, container security heavily depends on the user namespace uh, and it's still a component in container security in the container security area that is, uh, seems to be misunderstood, sometimes hard to use. Uh, we develop, as Stefan mentioned, a system container manager which runs unmodified Linux distributions with a similar workflow to virtual machines, uh, but just on a shared kernel. And we, over the years, we did a lot of work to properly use user namespaces, LSM, C groups, and other security measures to prevent um, uh, uh, container escapes and other issues. And we're uh, working hard in the kernel and in user space to make uh, just about every normal system run properly in unprivileged uh, containers. And one of our main goals is to keep our users uh, as safe as possible. And the user namespace is a core uh, component in this story. So um, there are two types of containers, uh, and only one uses the user namespace. Uh, the first type of container is a privileged container. Uh, this just means that the container UID is identical to uh, the host UID, which means real root, uh, root in the container equals real root uh, on the host. So that also means container breakouts are extremely serious uh, in these scenarios. But unfortunately, it is still the industry standard as most workloads use privileged containers, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, and the security of privileged containers mostly hinges on LSM's capabilities and SecOMP uh, coverage. So privileges are not really isolated enough or even at all. Um, and uh, this, is, this, can be, this can be a big issue. And our personal sense is that privileged containers aren't and cannot be root safe. Uh, as you can see, uh, privileged containers cause a majority of the CVAs. So it's, this is not just a statement that we, uh, that we tend to make. Uh, Likely, these are also not the CVEs from a single uh, runtime. These are just the CVEs from a single runtime. Uh, uh, Lexi doesn't even show, uh, sh uh, doesn't even accept uh, CVEs for privileged containers. Um, and uh, this is, as you can see, this is pretty bad. Most of them score at 9.3, 7.2, um, and so this is not this is not a great state. Uh, and privileged containers therefore shouldn't be used. So unprivileged containers. Uh, these are the active containers we actually really care about as they use the user namespace uh, and therefore are more secure in our opinion, uh, or not in our opinion, according to the kernel as well. Uh, unpri unprivileged containers uh, do not have root mapped to real root, which means container UID zero is not identical to host UID zero. Uh, so that also means container breakouts are bad, of course, but they are not as damaging as having uh, a, a container that has real root escape to the host. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the adoption of such unprivileged containers has been quite slow apart from Lexi and LexD. Uh, this has something to do with uh, the fact that you can't easily share file systems between containers, between unprivileged containers, which is something uh, which we'll touch upon uh, later in this talk. Um, and unprivileged containers, as you might have guessed, and as I've mentioned, use the user namespace as the main security, uh, name, uh, security mechanism. And uh, this is uh, great because the user namespace is the namespace that is actually concerned with isolating core privilege concepts. So uh, capabilities and their discretionary access permissions. And LSMs, to some extent, are just the icing on the cake. They're used on top of an extra safety net. Um, there are even advanced uh, versions of such containers where you don't even map UID zero in the container to any valid UID on the host. Uh, 
um, or sometimes unprivileged containers aren't even started by root, but by fully unprivileged uh, users on the host. So they provide a great additional security layer. Okay, so I'm going to be looking uh, a bit at the um, isolated user namespaces and uh, the state of things now and, and where we, we want to, to take them moving forward. So um, as Christian men mentioned, uh, like, a bridge container is definitely what we're pushing for. Uh, that relies on the user namespace. The, the default for most user namespace based container is to use the same uh, ID map for all containers. Um, this is not ideal. It is good from a security standpoint in that you can't harm the host because you're still using user namespace. But um, there are some amount of shared resources in the kernel that is tied to the kernel UID and kernel GID. And so if two containers use the same map, one user in one container may affect the same user in another um, sibling container. The, the main one of those uh, is related to uh, our limits. And it's something we've, we've definitely noticed before where one user reducing an R limit um, in one container might actually negatively impact another process running as the same user in another container. To avoid that and also to, to avoid any potential risk of um, data access or process access in the event of a, of a container breakout, um, we've been playing with the concept of isolated ID mappings in, in NextD for a while now, where we get um, non-contiguous, like we get uh, non-overlapping maps for each container. Uh, this does come with some issues of its own. Um, I'm going to go through, through some of that um, in the next few slides. So the, well, that kind of goes through the, the, the solution to some extent, but the problem we have um, at, at the core of it is that there is a shared um, space of 32 bit integers of UIDs and GIDs in the Linux kernel. And so, even with our implementation of isolated containers, um, we need to take from that one namespace, which means that. In our first implementation, we went with 65,536 UIDs and GIDs per container, which makes them POSIX compliant. But as it turns out, is not quite enough for many modern Linux workloads. Uh, specifically, if you're doing things like remote authentication or uh, if you're running nested containers, then you might still run out of, of UIDs and GIDs, which has forced our users quite often to bump all the way to 10 million UIDs and GIDs per container, at which point you can only run a few hundreds of those before you exhaust your entire ID space on the on, on the system. So um, as a way to, to improve on that and also to deal with issues like the lack of cooperation between user space processes, um, like if you're running multiple container managers, there's rarely communication between them to try and avoid using the same maps in multiple containers. Um, so we figured that we need a kernel enforced solution effectively. And one way, uh, well, the main way we're pushing for right now is to actually bump the in kernel type from 32 bit to 64 bit. Um, hiding the, um, the upper 32 bit from user space. So user space would only ever see the lower 32s and the upper 32 would let us do in kernel namespacing effectively, giving us the ability to to run like a full, you know, 32 bit of separate namespaces um, that each get the old 32 bit uh, UID and GID space. There are a lot of issues that come with, with this design too. Uh, obviously you can't write a 64 bit UID or GID on a file system. The, the file systems will remain 32 bit and all the user space interfaces will remain 32 bit. So the Linux we, we need to, to find ways to translate when needed or to have a fallback also when needed. Um, in the case, that's why we effectively end up setting an owner for the entire namespace, uh, owning UID and GID, which will be used um, for things like UCREDs and for uh, process ownership and some other things like that when it's, when, uh, when objects coming from an isolated user namespace are seen from outside of that namespace, like from a parent namespace, effectively. The 
benefits of this approach is that we can do very trivial user namespace nesting. We never need to like allocate a larger branch to the parent so that it can have children. That that completely goes away. Everyone gets to create the new user namespace with the old 32-bit uh, of your IDs and GIDs available to them. Um, that also completely fixes any workload issues because anything running in that container can just use any of the normal UIDs and GIDs. Don't need to think about oh, what's actually mapped in my namespace or there might be a gap in, in between, like uh, in the middle of my range or something like that. All of that goes away. That makes it possible to run LDAP, to run some of the systemd isolated units, to run some of the new SnapD features. All of that stuff just works. Um, it's also makes it um, quite a bit easier on the um, on the runtimes to create and manage user namespaces. So that should significantly improve adoption uh, by just making it so easy for just about anything to create a, a new user namespace. The the downside of all of this is that we de we need to deal uh, with file system access quite carefully um, because all of those now absolutely need translating. Um, and so we've got a few approaches around that, uh, which we'll detail later. But for the first step, what you can effectively think of is that only file systems that are virtual and can be mounted from within such a container uh, will be allowed. And for anything else, you're going to need to be using new kernel features that allow uh, specific mapping for a period user to configure. OK, um, so that was quite a bit of talking already. Let's just do a quick demo, shall we? Um, and for this one, we're going to be doing a demo of the different type of containers. So I'm going to first start by creating a oops, um, a privileged container. So let's use an Ubuntu training up for image, call a container called priv, and ask for it to be privileged. Um, I'm using LexD in this case, as you see. Uh, our default is actually to be unprivileged. So I've got to specifically say that I want something privileged. I'm creating a second container here, uh, which is unprivileged. And we'll create a third, which is configured to be isolated. There we go. So now we've got three containers. Um, one thing we can do is go look inside them. Um, and you're always going to see the same thing inside the container, like process ownership and everything is going to be the same regardless of the time. So if I go in the unprived one, we see the exact same thing. Isolated, whoop, that's a typo. Again, exact same thing. Now, if I go back in the privileged one and I go look at ID map, we see that there's no map in place. So that means that root in the container maps to root as of the container, as well as the following whole 32 bit range. Now, if we look at my unprived container, we're going to see. It's got a map um, starting at 1 million that maps uh, a billion UIDs and GIDs. So that's kind of our default for that. Um, if I was to start a second one of those, oops, wrong one, come on. Okay. Ah, there. Yeah. OK, uh, so if I look inside this one, uh, we'll see the exact same map be in place. But now if we look at our isolated one, we can see that it's it's mapped only 65k UIDs and GIDs and only and at a different sp spot. Now if we were to launch a second isolated one, and I enter the right one, we can see it's got the next slot effectively, this next offset. So isolated containers never share maps, and that works That works fine in the current state of things. But obviously, the the, the new isolated, cannot enforce that isolated containers um, will make that so much nicer by not having something like LexD do all of that math. That map isn't even required then anymore, luckily, mm -hmm. ideally. Yep. Uh, so right, supervising syscalls. Um, this is something which, uh, where we also have been spending quite uh, some time uh, to get around the limitations of user namespaces while also uh, uh, providing, uh, doing this in a safe way, essentially. Um, 
So um, let's briefly look at a few limitations of um, user namespaces. Um, the most obvious ones, or two of the most obvious ones, are um, creating device nodes uh, and mounting file systems. So if you are in an unprivileged container, um, then the user namespace you're in will prevent you from creating any device nodes, even harmless ones, um, which isn't uh, which doesn't really make sense for device nodes such as dev zero, dev null, dev full. So basically, the set of device nodes that is required for um, any kind of container to be usable or the Linux system to be usable at all, and that we already bind mount from the host into, to the container. So given that we already bind mount it from the host in the container and you have write access usually and read access, um, there is actually no need to not be able to create these device nodes. Mounting file systems is another one. So real file systems will not be mountable from inside user namespaces. This includes anything interesting like X4 and XFS. Um, and also, you can't uh, load and attach BBF programs. So user namespaces prevent you from um, maybe not necessarily always from loading, but definitely from attaching the BPF program to, for example, a C group, which is in 2020, is kind of uh, a, a limitation that a lot of people find off-putting about privileged containers. And given that BPF sees more and more adoption, uh, finding a way to get around such restrictions might be uh, quite useful. So um, second point, containers. Um, this ties into the syscall supervision uh, story. Um, SecComp is already used in containers. Uh, it's namely a way to restrict syscall that a task is allowed to make, and it allows to filter and block syscalls to reduce the attack surface of container. It's very important for, the, for additional container security as you can write very fine-grained filters um, in classic BPF, not eBPF, or not to be confused with eBPF, I should say. Um, and they allow you to filter on specific arguments or uh, even values for arguments. Uh, so you could specify, I only want to allow uh, specific make not amount syscalls to be performed to stay in uh, stay with the former examples. But the kernel handles these syscalls statically, meaning a second filter usually causes the kernel to skip a syscall or report an error code. And there is no way for any user space process to weigh in on this decision. Once that filter is loaded, the answer that the kernel will give uh, is, always, is always fixed. Um, so what is syscall supervision? Uh, it's basically a way, uh, or it's, we interpret this to be uh, a way uh, for user space to intercept uh, syscalls. And as I've mentioned before, um, SecComp seems to be quite suited for this because it's already able to intercept uh, syscalls and it's already widely adopted in containers, so they understand uh, what to do with this. And so syscall supervision is built on top of SecComp and is a way to outsource decisions about whether a syscall is allowed to user space um, by introducing a new option that you set on a filter. And when you load a SecComp filter, you can retrieve a file descriptor for the given tasks uh, seccomp filter. And this can be handed off to a privileged uh, user space process such as a container manager. And it provides two IOCTLs, uh, one receive and one sent IOCTL. The receive IOCTL can be used to get notified when an assist call that the filter is registered to listen on is actually performed. And the seccomp notify uh, send IOCTL can be used to respond uh, to the kernel and instruct it uh, to report back an error or success to uh, the user space process in question. Um, and as you can see, there's more advanced options available as well. You can also receive file descriptors from another task. It's also something which we added um, in recent kernels. Uh, it's a new dedicated syscall called PDFD getfd, which makes use of a new API that we've worked on for the last couple of years. And you can also, with uh, the new uh, released 5.9 kernel, inject file descriptors into uh, a task that is currently blocked um, in, uh, in SecComp with the SecComp notifier, which is the term we use for syscall supervision. The implementation is called SecComp notifier. Um, it's also based on a new IOCTL.
And uh, what the Cisco, uh, what Cisco supervision, or this new second mechanism, the second notifier allows you to do is it allows a process to do syscall emulation. So when we're talking about the make not or the mount uh, syscall, let's say you write a second filter that instructs second to trap to user space whenever a make not syscall is performed, then the container manager who can listen on the file descriptor for this task second filter will get a notification about the syscall performed it can use the receive IOCTL I mentioned before to receive information about the performed syscall. It can parse out the information, um, such as the arguments, and it can then decide based on the arguments uh, to emulate the syscall for the container. So for example, in the case of make not, it can decide to actually create a device node for the container, um, such as def0 or def null. In the case of mount, it, can inspect the target path, the soft path, the file system type, and if it knows what to expect, also the data passed, passed to the mount syscall. And then based uh, on a allow list, for example, decide that uh, any X4 mounts is to, be, uh, is to be allowed or even rewrite it to fuse. Um, you can do quite, uh, quite a bit of advanced things here. Um, and it also allows you to, so for scenarios, for example, with the, uh, with the mount syscall, um, because of inherent second restrictions, we can't necessarily write a filter so fine-grained that it would allow us um, to capture only those mount syscalls that we're definitely interested in, uh, but also mount syscalls that we accidentally, uh, that we accidentally intercept. But because of how syscall interception work, it would require us to emulate any accidentally mount a syscall that even if it would already be possible to mount, uh, to mount it inside of container. So let's say you accidentally intercept the mount of TempFS, the container manager would have to emulate this mount, which is a problem. And so we introduce the ability to continue syscalls uh, which needs to be obviously uh, taken with a grain of salt. It cannot be used to implement security policies um, in user space. It is also possible to uh, open, to intercept the open syscall nowadays. Um, and it's also impossible to intercept the PPF syscall nowadays because we can retrieve and inject file descriptors. So even if you open a file descriptor for another task, you can then inject that file descriptor into the target task that the container manager, for example, received. So this is a powerful mechanism and Stefan will now continue uh, to give a demo. Yeah, the, the, the part about not using it to, to do that, uh, any kind of uh, access control is quite important to keep in mind. Uh, there is really, and especially because well, what we're gonna, what you're gonna often do inside a, a notifier handler is access the process memory and resolve pointers, and then do compression on those pointers. It's perfectly fine for you to then decide to go and do it for the container um, after copying those values. Uh, but it's not okay to be like, okay, this thing is safe, I let the kernel do it now, because those are still pointers and can still change before they're actually being run. So you can never deny based on that information effectively, because the user can race you and trick you into accepting something that you shouldn't. So um, on the demo side, on, for LexD, we, we first implemented the um, system code interception for setXADA and for MakeNode. That was to let you run uh, most Docker containers inside in a privileged LexD container by dealing with the, the few odd file system interactions that uh, unpacking some Docker layers would use. So that's the first two we did. We then added uh, mount interception, including redirection to fuse. And we've also added uh, the BPF interception specifically for uh, C group uh, device policies at this point. So what we're gonna just show here as a quick demo is we're gonna create a new container and go inside it. And now let's create, uh, let's pick a device node. So let's just look at what we have in dev, okay. Let's do dev zero. So we're gonna be creating something called dev blah, which is a character device with major one minor five, which is the same as dev zero, as you can see. This doesn't work. Uh, this is an unprivileged container. The kernel tells us no. So let's stop the container. 
and then tell Lexd make node is fine, and then go back. To be clear, when we configure Lexd that way, it doesn't allow all make nodes because that would be a security disaster. Uh, instead, we have a fixed list uh, that's allowed in Lexd that includes creating like a zero zero uh, character device. It also includes creating any of the devices that comes directly with Lexd. In this case, we're perfectly allowed to create this particular file. Uh, as a quick example, if I was to I don't know, pick an NVMe drive okay, on my host and I try to create that particular device, let's call it blow on, the interception does not let us do it because that would be terribly, terribly unsafe if I was allowed to do this. And that's pretty much it for the for how this quant interception works in the next day. We've got a lot more options to intercept different syscalls and different behaviors, but that's kind of the, the main idea behind it. Doing that configuration puts in place a uh, secconf entry for the given syscall. We try to be as restrictive as possible to avoid needlessly going to user space. Then user space does the evaluation and runs it uh, as needed, or if not, we'll just tell the kernel to continue. Okay, next up is uh, file system. So I kind of hinted at that, well, we hinted at that a couple of times so far already. Uh, one thing that's pretty difficult with unprivileged containers in the user namespace in general is file system access um, because your actual file system still stores good old 32-bit UIDs and GIDs. Uh, your container might have some map, might have a different map the time after that. What do you do to handle file system access in, in that world? Well, so there are a few things. Um, and especially a few things that we'd like to, to make possible uh, and that are not out of the box with a user namespace. One thing is just sharing file systems, uh, whether you want to share a path from your host system into an unprivileged container or between two unprivileged containers that use a different map, so two isolated containers effectively. Um, that's normally not possible. Uh, because like one of the two will be the source and the other will see everything as overflow UID, overflow GID, so effectively as minus one, one as minus one as far as the ownership, because there's no way to represent that owner inside the target container. Um, there are some limited, some limited ways around that. You can technically use things like POSIX ACLs to allow the target container access to those files. They will still see all the ownership as being wrong, but at least they'd be allowed to go in and create entries, um, but are still gonna behave very weirdly in general. Um, and if you're thinking of doing something like that for a root file system, for example, um, well, at that point, what you need to do is effectively unpack your image, which is normally not uh, shifted, and then go and manually change all of the ownership information. So all the UIDs, all the GIDs, all the POSIX ACL, all of the file capabilities, anything else that's stored within that root file system um, that stores a UID or GID needs to be shifted to the map used by the container. That's what we do in LexD. We've got pretty complex logic to do it. Um, it is difficult to do without running into security problems. And it's also slow. Um, if you're on an SSD, you're probably looking at like one to two seconds shifting time, which is not too bad. If you're on a spinning drive, you might be looking at minutes in some cases, which is really not pleasant. And it keeps uh, getting bad with growing root of us. Uh, right, sorry. I mean, the more, the more files you're gonna get in, in your file system and the more fragmented your underlying block device, the worse it's gonna get. Um, the other thing with, with that is that two isolated containers could not share a5 system. Um, it's the same issue, um, but yeah, that, that keeps popping up. And it's something that's, that we've noticed ever since user namespaces have been a thing, so a long time ago. And for a long time, we were going with, okay, fine, we just shift, and then we don't allow attaching between isolated containers. And if you want to pass a path from the host into your container, then you need to deal with POSIX ACLs. That was our stance for a while, uh, but obviously we would like the performance of not having to do a new shifting, and we would like the um, flexibility of being able to share paths whichever way we want and having ownership nicely lined up and everything working. So we've been looking at options. We did implement some of those options, and we are looking at doing things in an even cleaner way uh, in the very near future. So Christian will be going through some of those. Yes. 
Um, this has been a problem that has been around for quite a while, uh, how to improve file system interactions for unprivileged containers. And so a lot of different pro approaches have been thrown around. And uh, here are some that have been proposed and one that we think we might be uh, going with in the future or hope that we are going with in the future. Um, so one of the first approaches we have seen uh, is uh, not overriding CRETs uh, in the VFS. Uh, I've, uh, this is a mistake of mine, but um, so the idea of ShiftFS was originally um, uh, to enable containers to share file system. That's obvious. So we use shift file ownership to match the user names to user you, the user namespace, the ID mapping in the user namespace of the container. And this was done by implementing a tiny overlay like file system that could be mounted uh, inside unprivileged containers. And as I said, that would shift file ownership according to the caller's user namespace so that the caller could, for example, you could leave if you wanted to, uh, the root of of the container completely unmapped. Uh, so for example, UID zero up to uh, 65536. Um, and then uh, ShiftFS would take care that any ID mapping that the container has would be sort of, if you think of it, shifted back to the underlying uh, file system so that you could actually write to disk. Uh, but as we've uh, realized over time, ShiftFS as a separate file system is not a viable solution. It, gets you into ki all kinds of issues with IOCTLs. Um, you need to make sure that you drop the right capabilities and often you end up in a state where you would want kind of a mix out of the uh, original file system mount as credentials and the container users credentials. So it's, it's not a great look and it's not a solution. We feel comfortable uh, upstreaming as we've said at, in multiple uh, talks. One approach- yeah, the Sorry, yes. I was going to say the, the, the fact is like we, we effectively need file system specific logic within ShiftFS is a pretty clear sign that this is not something clear, not something we can really upstream. And that's definitely what we run into with IOCTOLs because the, uh, ShiftFS pretends to be the underlying file system so that we, the workloads running in the container can act just as if they're running on the underlying file system. But that means that if your underlay is a BRFS, you're going to need shift affairs to be aware of what this volume is and handle uh, the right credential transitions for things like subvolume creation, subvolume de deletion, but at the same time prevent you from accessing things like device management, which would be global to the system and would be a very bad thing for you to be able to access with effectively a root credential. Indeed. So that's definitely tricky and we've had to do a bunch of that for different file system features. Uh, it's possible, it works, but it's it's not something that we can realistically ever ever push upstream. Like it, it feels way too hacky. Uh, and so we need a different solution. Um, I'm going to uh, quickly present uh, more or less three other solutions um, since we're nearing the end of our talk. Um, one option we pursued uh, last year, I think, was to introduce, uh, which would have been an easier solution, is to introduce new proc files in addition to UID map and GID map, introduce FS UID map and FS GID map that would let you create independent uh, mappings for your FS UID and FS GID, which are the IDs that actually count when you create files on disk for most file systems. And so the idea was that users can write custom mappings for their file system, uh, for their file system IDs. Uh, the problem, there are problems with this approach and advantages. One uh, glaring problem is that requires special treatment of ProcFS and SysFS. So for example, if you were to write an identical mapping to the initial user namespace, then you could inside of a user namespace access and change all ProcFS and SysFS files potentially, or get access to ProcFS and SysFS files that you shouldn't have otherwise access to, which is obviously not great. Uh, the advantage is that the approach is relatively simple. So the VFS doesn't need uh, to be modified too deeply, it still needs quite a lot of modification. And actually I think some file systems would uh, with this approach be, need to be changed too, but overall it's pretty clean. Problem is it doesn't handle all use cases. Um, for example, it's not possible to ID map without being inside of a user namespace, which is becoming an increasingly pop, uh, uh, important um, uh, requirement. Another approach is to uh, 
use override creds. Uh, so uh, this has its own drawbacks. It, first of all, it seems elegant and clean, but you need to allocate you need to allocate uh, temporary credentials in the VFS on each path lookup, um, and that can get that's not great, especially if you consider in RCU lookup mode, then you can't really, you need to take care to allocate it um, at the beginning of path lookup before you are actually entering into RCU uh, path lookup. That's already problematic. It also requires override cred everywhere in the VFS, at least every time you're crossing uh, a mount point. And it's I'm not completely clear how well this works for all file systems. This might just be me and I would need to do another audit, but um, file systems that call override cred themselves or change FS IDs might get confused with this approach. Another problem is it doesn't handle all use cases too. So for example, it's not possible to ID map without being inside of username space, which also was a drawback of the FSU ID and FSG ID map. And this is a use case we think we might, uh, we really need to handle, especially with the rise of system D home D and uh, other nice features. So one approach we are currently pursuing and about, are about to propose, or maybe by this time we'll have already proposed, is ID mapped bind mounts. Um, so it's essentially the idea to attach a user namespace to uh, the VFS mount in the kernel. And then inodes are shifted by the user namespace the VFS mount, VFS mount has been marked with. So the access, so uh, when you try to create a file, through which a VFS mount you're trying to create, that file becomes irrelevant. Um, it requires more extensive changes to the VFS because the user namespace is passed down, even sometimes uh, down to the file system for object creation. Uh, but it feel, it, it's conceptually, it's very clean and it allows us to cover all use cases actually. Um, it also allows us to set up ID mapped mounts in the initial user namespace. So you could, for example, mount your X4 file system once um, in the host, and then uh, uh, for different users without needing to chone, uh, providing specific subdirectories for each of your users uh, by just giving them separate mount points uh, that have a specific ID mapping applied uh, to them and other nice use cases. So this is actually a very powerful mechanism and we're excited about this and hope this is something that, uh, that that people will get excited about too. Right, and just before before going into to demo for that bit, it's also worth mentioning that I mean everything we've said so far kind of ties into each other. So when looking at the 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 work we're doing around the isolated uh, user namespace in the kernel, effectively bumping from those uh, thirty two bit KUID KJID over to sixty four bit KUID KJID. Um, as I mentioned, you won't you won't be able to really interact with your host file system in that mode because you need some something to know what you're supposed to be actually writing as. Uh, otherwise, you either are unable to do anything or you're allowed to do a lot more things than you should do, and then you've got a massive security issue on your hands. Um, this approach will effectively let us do a bind mount of a path on the host file system into uh, a target path, which is then properly tied to the isolated um, user namespace. And so the isolated user namespace can then effectively pivot route to that, make that their, their um, root file system, and then move on and do normal IOs. And any writes they do will go through the configured mapped map onto the, the host file system. Alrighty. So for our last demo today, let's just clear this stuff. Uh, we're gonna just be looking at the current state of things. So I don't have the new experimental patches for, for any of that new uh, ID mapped bind mount, uh, but we can show what we've had, what we've done so far with ShiftFS. So that's um, ShiftFS was effectively started by James Bottomley uh, at IBM a while back. Then Canonical put some considerable amount of time from both uh, Seth Forshi and, and Christian to cover pretty much all the cases we care about, make it um, really usable for our users. And it's present, present in the Ubuntu kernel uh, today. It's not on by default, but you can definitely turn it on. And I've got it on uh, enabled on my laptop. So let's just start and create a new container. Uh, okay, right. 
let's just already had one of those. There we go. Okay, just create a new C1 container here. If I go in that container, just that screen. When you look at proc self mat info, that's one of the few ways you can actually tell whether you're running on shiftfs. Here you'll see on the first line that it shows uh, slash is a shiftfs mount. It shows what the underlay is, and it's got pass through equals three, which means we uh, pass through ioctals uh, that we understand. But uh, if I do start on slash, you'll see that the um, the startfs call actually gives me the zfs magic in this case, and not shiftfs. So we can. That, that's how we effectively get most of user space to behave as if it's running on the underlay file system and do all their normal IOCTOLs is by also faking that bit. Um, now let's pass my home directory into that container. So we're gonna just add a new device called home. Uh, the source path is slash home on my host and I pass that as slash mnt slash home in the container. And I need to specify this a disk. There we go. Okay. So if I look at such MNT, there we go. So it is passed in, but as you can see, I, I can't access anything. And everything is nobody no group, which is not the real nobody no group. People tend to be a bit confused about that. It's actually the overflow UID, overflow GID, which means the UID that actually owns this path, which is user 1000, 1000 or something on the host, uh, is not cannot be represented inside that namespace. And so it shows up as overflow in this case, nobody in our group. Now let's detach this thing. So remove C1 home. And let's just do it again, but this time do shift equals true. And now if we go look at uh, Mount Info, the last entry here, you can see that slash MNT slash home is now a shift of S mount of some other, oh, this Plex D path. And now if I look, oops, wrong one. If I look at MNT, MNT home, hey, look at that. You can actually resolve the UIDs and GIDs and actually access the data. So that's ShiftFS here working and doing the translation. I'll just remove it, so it should be gone now. Yep. And that's it for ShiftFS. Let's just switch back to the slides and back here. So that's it for, for what we had today. Uh, that I've, I think I should have given you a pretty good uh, overview of kind of where we're standing at with the user namespace. Uh, we are definitely still pushing for absolutely everyone to use them and for push containers to burn in a fire as quickly as possible. Um, the, the the main issues I think we've, we've identified over, over the years uh, is differently the, the, all the need for cooperation and planning to some extent of the container managers um, for UIDs and GID ranges in the user namespace, which is one of the big issues. And the other aspect being the file system layer. We've got plans to fix both of those that should make it possible for everyone to use user namespaces and for privileged containers to go away for good. Um, the file system layer we might just mention is particularly relevant for application containers because for those you need to be able to have a set of layers that are distributed that are none of them are shifted and then you need to support multiple containers each with their own map yet to be able to use the same stack of layers. So the, the work that Christian has been doing around um, VFS layer uh, bind mount, ID map bind mount will make that very easy and we'll completely sort out um, this particular need. That's it for all we have. Uh, if you've got any any questions, uh, just ask. Uh, there are contact, contact details there as well as some uh, useful websites. You can even go and try Lexd online from your web browser. And I think we're just about out of time. So we are. thank you, everyone. Thank you. And that's it.